Investigators solemnly identified the two bodies found in Carroll County as 13-year-olds Libby German and Abby Williams. Now, we still don't know what happened to them after they disappeared during an afternoon hiking trip. The man in this video has never been found and never been identified. But police say he remains a person of interest in the unsolved 2017 murder of two Indiana teens. Along with that haunting image, his voice was found captured on a cell phone belonging to one of the victims. Only a coward would do such a thing. We are confident that you have told someone what you have done. New revelations in the years-long investigation into the murder of two young teen girls in Delphi, Indiana. Freshly unsealed court documents allege Richard Allen admitted to killing Abigail Williams and Libby German, quote, no less than five times while talking to his wife and his mother on the public jail phones. But the arrest of Richard M. Allen of Delphi on two counts of murder is sure a major step in leading to the conclusion of this long-term and complex investigation. Now, in new court filings, Allen's legal team listed 92 reasons that they say makes it unlikely that Allen acted alone. Instead, his lawyers are blaming a white nationalist group claiming that the girls were, quote, ritualistically sacrificed. It's a lot to unpack there. In the filing, Allen's lawyers call into question the timeline of the murders. They say it's unlikely he could have forced the girls down the hill, across a river, killed them, and staged their bodies in less than an hour and a half. It's more than likely you've seen the clip in that opening montage featuring a man in a blurry video approaching two teens on a bridge. Since 2017, this unknown figure, dubbed Bridge Man, has haunted our screens, having been captured on the phone of 14-year-old Liberty German, moments before she was murdered alongside her best friend, 13-year-old Abigail Williams. This video, as well as a number of images posted to Snapchat by Libby around the same time, became disturbing glimpses into the unspeakable tragedy that befell them. In the years following the horrific crime, Numerous theories and suspects became the focus of authorities and amateur investigators, but none of them seemed to lead to anything, forcing many to believe that the case had turned cold and perhaps would never find resolution like so many of the other cases we've covered here on this channel. The identity of this mysterious bridge man, who almost certainly was involved in their deaths, seemed to be painstakingly out of reach. But then, after just over five years, in October 2022, a suspect was finally arrested by the authorities and charged with the murders of the two teens. With the arrest of this suspect, named as Richard Allen, a huge amount of information was revealed about the case and what may have really happened to the two girls. With the prosecution and the defense team already battling it out to present the strongest case, fighting both for and against reasonable doubt in regards to Allen's guilt, the outcome of the trial seems anything but certain, regardless of the true guilt or innocence of Allen. While the prosecutors are confident in their evidence tying Allen to the murders, Allen's team has presented a slew of counter-arguments, now claiming that a cult of Odinists were behind the crime, which they claim was a ritualistic sacrifice. So with the trial fast approaching later this year, I want to go all the way back to the beginning and take a proper look at this unsettling case, exploring all the twists, turns, and revelations that have led us to where we are today. This is the tragic story of Liberty German and Abigail Williams, the Delphi Snapchat murders, the story so far. On the 13th of February 2017, inseparable best friends Abby Williams and Libby German devised a plan to embark on a hiking excursion near the picturesque expanse of the Monon High Bridge Trail, situated to the east of their quaint hometown of Delphi, Indiana. With the day off from school, they seized the opportunity presented by the unseasonably warm winter weather to venture outdoors, capture some photographs, and immerse themselves in the allure of their cherished hangout spot. At around 1.45 p.m., Libby's sister, Kelsey, dropped them off at the deserted bridge, marking the starting point of their planned hike. They made arrangements to rendezvous with their family later that afternoon at the same location. The girls embarked on a hike on the Monon High Bridge spanning Deer Creek, traversing through the secluded woodland in remote Deer Creek Township. At precisely 2.07 p.m., Libby shared a photograph on Snapchat from the summit of Indiana's second highest bridge. Little did anyone know that this would be the final glimpse of the two girls before tragedy struck. Upon the girls' failure to reappear at the predetermined rendezvous spot with Libby's father at half-past five that evening, concerned family members initiated a search. 
But as the afternoon progressed without any sign of the girls, they reached out to the sheriff's department and the Delphi Police Department for assistance, fearing something terrible may have happened. The search. Without delay, law enforcement personnel and firefighters were mobilized to conduct a thorough search of the vicinity. Sheriff Leesonby, speaking to news cameras that afternoon, initially expressed optimism, stating there was no immediate indication of danger to the girls. Authorities surmised that perhaps the girls had simply become disoriented while navigating the trails and gotten themselves lost. The sole tangible clue regarding the girls' whereabouts was a photo captured by Libby, depicting Abby strolling along the bridge, which she had shared on social media. More than 100 volunteers heeded the call for assistance and joined the search effort, while aerial surveillance was deployed to maximize coverage during the remaining daylight hours. Subsequently, as night descended, authorities initiated efforts to track the location of the girls' phones through a process commonly referred to as pinging. Regrettably, these endeavors proved futile, with the sheriff expressing his belief that the phones were either switched off or had run out of battery. As the day transitioned into night and temperatures cooled, search efforts persisted until midnight when they were officially halted. However, some dedicated family members and friends continued scouring the area well into the overnight hours. The following morning on February 14th, 2017, the search for Libby and Abby resumed, marking a somber and unsettling Valentine's Day for the families and friends of the missing girls. With the break of dawn, search teams expanded their scope, venturing beyond the vicinity of the abandoned railroad tracks and into the wooded terrains surrounding Deer Creek. Despite the fervent prayers of the searchers, the glimmer of hope that the girls had simply lost their way quickly dimmed. And then, approximately a mile from the location where the two adolescents had disappeared, searchers made a grim discovery on a parcel of private land situated along Deer Creek, north of the bridge. At approximately 1.50 p.m., Sheriff Leesonby, Delphi Police Chief Steve Mullins, and Indiana State Police Representative Kim Riley convened a joint press briefing to disclose that two bodies had been located during the ongoing search for Abby and Libby. Merely a day later, authorities convened another press conference, during which they formally confirmed that the bodies discovered were those of Liberty German and Abigail Williams. The investigation. The community was engulfed in sorrow. Fear rippled through the hearts of children, prompting parents to hold their loved ones tighter. During the news conference, the Indiana State Police unveiled a photograph retrieved from Libby's phone depicting an unidentified man strolling along the Delphi Historic Trail. Although the entirety of the video it came from and its audio have yet to be revealed, investigators have indicated that it documents suspected criminal activity. From this footage, investigators released two blurry images featuring a man believed to have been trailing the girls on the bridge, a brief segment showing the man walking, and an audio snippet of the man presumably the same individual, instructing them with the phrase, guys down the hill. During the press conference where this audio was disclosed, authorities commended Libby for her quick thinking and courage in clandestinely recording the encounter. While police confirmed the retrieval of additional evidence from the phone, they opted not to divulge further details to avoid jeopardizing any future trial. Another significant detail disclosed by investigators is their belief that the perpetrator who took the lives of Libby and Abby either hails from Delphi or possesses familiarity with the town, potentially through employment or other connections. I've traversed the high bridge myself. It stands 65 to 70 feet above the river deck and hasn't seen a train since 1929, remarked Superintendent Carter during a press briefing. The ties are decaying and it sways considerably, making it a challenging crossing for someone unfamiliar. My personal opinion is that it wasn't the assailant's first time on the high bridge. Authorities emphasized their desire to converse with anyone who had parked in the vicinity or frequented the area surrounding the trail on the day the girls visited the park. Approximately five months into the investigation, Indiana State Police unveiled their initial composite sketch and profile of a suspect. At the time, the suspect was described as a white male standing between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 10 inches tall, weighing 180 to 220 pounds with reddish-brown hair and an undisclosed eye color. In this initial sketch, investigators indicated that the man's hat had been altered to enhance the recognizability of his facial features. On March 1, 2017, former Indianapolis Colts punter Pat McAfee and team owner Jim Irsay made a generous contribution of $97,000 to the reward fund established for information in the case, helping the fund surge to $240,000. In 2019, a second sketch was revealed by authorities. This sketch, bearing resemblance to a completely different individual, was then considered to represent the primary person of interest in the homicides of Libby and Abby. Accompanying the new sketch, law enforcement also revised their description of the suspect to be a man aged between 18 and 40, 
who might appear significantly younger than his actual age. The composite sketches were pieced together based on the accounts of two distinct individuals present in the area on the fateful day of the murders. Indiana State Police disclosed later that the second sketch, unveiled over two years after the tragic event, was actually the initial one they had drafted. Furthermore, they asserted that the second sketch was now deemed a more precise representation of the suspect, albeit the actual perpetrator likely resembles a blend of both renderings. A sketch isn't a photograph, a sketch is a sketch and that's crucial for everyone to grasp, emphasized Carter. I believe that when we apprehend the individual, it will be a fusion of those two. The quest to apprehend the perpetrator garnered nationwide attention, with approximately 6,000 electronic billboards spanning across 46 states utilized to solicit information from the public, the Indiana State Police, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Carroll County Sheriff's Office, and the Delphi Police Department, all committed to resolving this homicide case, adopted the motto, Today is the Day, with each day at the department commencing with a collective prayer. The law enforcement personnel dedicated themselves to relentless workdays, often spanning 20 hours with little to no sleep, all in pursuit of one objective. A vast team of investigators meticulously pursued thousands of leads, taking a toll on everyone involved. I need to be here for Abby and Libby, asserted one detective, because I am going to find who did this and we are going to hold them responsible for their actions. Initial suspects. Over the years, investigators received an influx of over 30,000 tips and conducted interviews with numerous potential suspects. One of the first major suspects in the case was Daniel Nations. Nations had been taken into custody in Colorado after reportedly menacing hikers with a hatchet along a trail in the state. Upon his arrest, investigators from Indiana journeyed to Colorado to conduct inquiries into Nation's potential involvement in the murders of Abby and Libby. However, despite bearing a resemblance to the sketch of their suspect, Nation's was ultimately ruled out by investigators, forcing them to move on to new leads. Thomas Bruce, a former pastor, was then looked into by the Indiana State Police in connection to the Delphi murders after being imprisoned for murdering a woman and sexually assaulting two others in November 2018 because Bruce had a similar stature to the man in Libby's video, and was even wearing similar clothes during his attacks. He seemed like a strong candidate for the unknown murderer. However, authorities were never able to tie him to the crime in any way. Another suspect that was linked to the case was John Miller, 63, who was arrested in 2018 for the cold case assault and murder of eight-year-old April Tinsley. Having lived only two hours away from Delphi, Miller had left a number of notes in public claiming he would strike again after having killed April. Ultimately, no definitive ties to this disturbing killer were made in regards to the case. In 2019, Charles Eldridge was arrested in Union City, Indiana after attempting to meet up with a teenage girl for sex. Charged with child molestation, he was also linked to the murders of Abby and Libby due to his strong resemblance to both the initial police sketch and the bridge man in the video. However, authorities reportedly ruled him out as a suspect due to not matching the updated sketch which they perceived to be more accurate. Then, in 2020, authorities thought they found a strong suspect in Keegan Klein who was arrested and entered a guilty plea to 25 unrelated felony charges encompassing child solicitation and exploitation, possession of child pornography, and obstruction of justice. Klein admitted to being an online predator and utilizing a fake social media profile to communicate with Libby prior to her tragic demise. According to police documents, Klein allegedly claimed to have arranged a meeting with her at the location where she was ultimately found deceased. On the very day of her murder, Klein utilized a fake Instagram profile to catfish her under the name Anthony Schatz. Despite vehemently denying any involvement in the girl's murders, Klein disclosed that he attempted to discuss the Delphi murders with investigators. However, he lamented that authorities showed little interest in his insights regarding the case. According to Klein, he shared his password for the catfish account with other people, including his father, who he believed could be a prime suspect in the killings. The extent of Klein's knowledge about the murders and his eagerness to engage with law enforcement regarding the matter remain shrouded in mystery. Klein is currently serving a 40-year prison sentence for his crimes. James Chadwell, 43, also became a person of interest in the case after his arrest and conviction in 2021 for the sexual assault and strangulation of a nine-year-old girl he lured to his home a mere 20 miles away from where Abby and Libby were murdered. Thankfully, the girl survived and Chadwell is now serving a 90-year sentence for the attack. Investigators looked into Chadwell as a potential suspect, but again failed to establish any definitive ties to the crime, despite him bearing a striking resemblance to the second sketch. Internet investigators also pointed out that Chadwell has tattoos of two girls crying blood which eerily resemble the murdered teenagers. While it might seem futile to explore these suspects, 
given a true suspect is currently awaiting trial for the crimes. It adds important context to the investigation and how it progressed over the years. Arrest in 2022. For the past few years, the town of Delphi has been illuminated by orange bulbs, symbolizing the community's unwavering commitment to ensuring justice is served for Abby and Libby until their killer is apprehended. Then in 2022, that moment appeared to have finally arrived, with the arrest of Richard Allen, a married father and pharmacy technician at a nearby CVS store situated in the heart of the town, for the murders. The arrest of Richard M. Allen of Delphi on two counts of murder is indeed a significant step toward concluding this lengthy and intricate investigation, remarked Superintendent Carter. However, he cautioned, This investigation is far from complete, and we will not jeopardize its integrity by releasing or discussing documents or information before the appropriate time. During the press conference, it was disclosed that Allen had pleaded not guilty during the initial hearing, forcing the next stage of the case to unfold within the confines of the courtroom. In November 2022, a county court unsealed new evidence shedding light on the case. According to the probable cause affidavit, Allen placed himself at the scene of the crime during interviews. In a 2017 interview with the police, Allen acknowledged being on the same trail as the girls on the day of the murders. Fast forward five years to October 2022, and Allen confessed to law enforcement that he encountered two young girls on the trails east of Freedom Bridge and admitted to walking on the Monon High Bridge, located near the crime scene. The affidavit also mentioned footage from one of the girls' phones, capturing either Abby or Libby stating that the approaching man had a gun, a detail that had been previously unknown to the public. Arguably the most significant piece of evidence unveiled is the discovery of an unspent 40 caliber round adjacent to one of the victim's bodies. Ballistics analysis has confirmed that this round originated from one of Allen's firearms. Despite pleading not guilty to the charges, Allen purportedly confessed to his wife, Kathy Allen, during a jailhouse phone conversation following his arrest. In the phone call, he admits several times that he committed the offenses as charged. His wife, Kathy Allen, abruptly ends the conversation. Court documents revealed. Investigators have remained tight-lipped regarding the specifics of the evidence leading to his arrest, aside from disclosing that a bullet recovered near the victim's bodies was traced back to the suspect's firearm. Authorities noted that Allen failed to provide a satisfactory explanation for the presence of a bullet from his gun at the crime scene. During police questioning, Allen asserted that he never permitted anyone to utilize or borrow his firearm. A significant lingering enigma in the case revolves around the potential involvement or awareness of other individuals in the Delphi murders. Following Allen's arrest in late November 2022, prosecutors hinted at the possibility of another suspect being linked to the killings. During a hearing, Carroll County Prosecutor Nicholas McClelland argued against unsealing case documents, citing concerns about jeopardizing the multi-year investigation. We have good reason to believe that Allen was not acting alone. There may be other individuals involved, McClelland asserted in court. Additionally, McClelland contended that releasing an unredacted affidavit could potentially subject witnesses in the investigation to harassment. Subsequent to the hearing, Allen's legal counsel expressed surprise at the revelation of a potential second suspect implicated in the murders. If you read the probable cause affidavit, it does not mention anything about any other person, remarked Allen's attorney, noting, that was news to us. In another unsettling twist, a picture was uncovered showing Allen smiling at work with a sketch of the murder suspect in what would be his own case on the wall right behind him. The Odinist cult claims. In late 2022, Allen's attorneys filed a startling court document proposing that Libby and Abby met their demise at the hands of a Nordic cult, with which Allen purportedly had no ties. Furthermore, the attorneys alleged that the search conducted at Allen's residence on October 13, 2022, was unconstitutional. According to court records, they contended that prosecutors failed to include vital information in their application for a search warrant. Their strategy involved presenting evidence indicating that followers of Odinism, a pagan Norse faith allegedly co-opted by white supremacists, were accountable for the murders. Their extensive 136-page memorandum asserted that investigators discovered various ritualistic symbols at the crime scene, ranging from sticks meticulously arranged atop the victims' bodies to an F painted in blood on a nearby tree. According to the documents, the attorneys allege that numerous personnel at the Westville Correctional Facility are members of the Odinite cult and have subjected Allen to threats, intimidation, and psychological torment. They emphasize that Allen had no association with white supremacist factions, pagan beliefs, or Odinism. Moreover, the documents referenced four additional individuals as potential suspects, whom law enforcement has never formally identified as individuals of interest. 
According to the documents, one of the individuals implicated was purportedly a member of the Odinite cult, whose son was allegedly romantically involved with Abby. This unidentified individual supposedly shared images on social media that resembled the crime scene. Furthermore, the documents allege that a man from a nearby locality confessed the murders to his sister. Allen's legal team asserted that two additional individuals were complicit in the killings. They contended that the ongoing investigation has failed to adequately pursue the Odinist suspects, despite compelling evidence implicating Odinites in the murders. The attorneys claimed that the suspects were identified in a 12-page Odin report, authored by an Indiana State Police trooper, which authorities ignored. Quoting the trooper, the documents stated, It seemed to me to border on almost a satanic type of worshipping, sacrificing, but I couldn't really wrap my brain around it. Moreover, the documents referenced an 85-page report by another investigator, which purportedly indicated that the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit concluded the individuals responsible for the homicides were involved in Nordic beliefs. Nevertheless, investigators from the Indiana State Police have affirmed that the FBI did not issue such a determination. In response to the allegations made by Allen's attorneys, one of the men implicated in the Delphi murders as part of the purported ritualistic sacrifice expressed his intention to pursue legal recourse, citing the profound disruption these sensational claims have caused in his life. The defense's claims here remind me of the Dorothy Jane Scott case previously covered in this channel. At the crime scene, it was claimed sticks were arranged ritualistically, making crosses and a coffin for the victim, and that marks on trees were linked to Satanism and the occult. Decades later, actual images from the crime scene were uncovered, showing none of these details were present. While I am not in a position to definitively say these claims are unfounded in this case, natural formations and unrelated evidence was frequently interpreted as occult and relevant during the Satanic Panic era, and this defense seems alarmingly reminiscent of this. In almost every single one of those cases, it turned out to be nothing more than witnesses and police officials seeing signs and clues that simply weren't there that fit their narrative of Satanism and killer cults. Prosecutors revealed that during his time in custody, Allen had made several admissions regarding the murders of Libby and Abby, including discussions with his wife and mother. The disclosure was made by Prosecutor McClellan during a court session shortly after the defense's request to relocate Allen to a different facility was submitted. It has been speculated that the recent assertions of mistreatment by purported Odinist prison staff could be a preemptive strategy by the defense to challenge the validity of Allen's admissions. Instead of attributing Allen's behavior and confessions to a purported decline in mental health, the defense appears to be suggesting coercion, claiming these Odinist guards have forced his confessions. Given the prosecution has been seeking access to Allen's mental health records, it could be speculated that the defense no longer see mental health as a viable defense once all the information is available to the prosecution, leading to their change in tactics. The cause of death. For years, the public remained unaware of the exact circumstances surrounding the girls' deaths. It wasn't until June 2023 that case documents were unsealed by Allen County Judge Francis C. Gull. Autopsies of the girls determined their deaths as homicides, with their injuries inflicted by a sharp object. The documents revealed, detailing how the bodies were found covered in blood. Furthermore, the documents noted that certain articles of clothing belonging to the girls were missing from the scene, including a pair of underwear and a sock with beliefs that the killer had taken souvenirs. However, the specific weapon used in the tragic teen's killings has yet to be disclosed to the public. Court records unveiled that Libby's iPhone was discovered beneath her body, containing the 43-second video pivotal to the investigation. Additionally, the documents highlighted the presence of three girls on the delphi Munnan High Bridge Trail on the day of Libby and Abby's disappearance. These witnesses reportedly spotted a man in the vicinity. Remarkably, the description provided by these girls matched that of the individual captured in Libby's iPhone video. One of the witnesses described the man as kind of creepy, as per the documents. The upcoming trial. Initially scheduled for a January 2024 trial, Allen's legal team faced upheaval as they were removed from the case due to the leakage of evidence intended for presentation in court to the public domain. The judge presiding over Allen's murder trial postponed the trial date to October 2024. This delay was necessitated as Allen's new legal representation argued that presenting a defense within such a short time frame after being assigned to the case would be impossible. The initial attorneys representing Allen were removed from the case after explicit photos related to the murders were leaked online. There is speculation that an individual gained entry to one of the attorney's offices where evidence pertinent to the case was stored. Allen's trial is currently scheduled to occur from October 15th to November 1st, 2024. The victims 
I think it's important to close this video with some information regarding the victims rather than simply exploring the crime and the suspects. Both Abby and Libby shared a passion for music, with both playing the saxophone in their middle school band. They also had a keen interest in photography and painting, and both were enthusiastic members of the softball team. Libby is fondly remembered as the family's baker, renowned for her skill in making chocolate chip cookies. Libby had a penchant for sticky notes, often leaving heartfelt messages on her grandmother's car visor. One such note read, I love you. Thank you for everything you do for me and Kelsey. Libby. She would scatter sticky notes throughout the house and even gifted her teachers with them, always expressing her gratitude for those around her. Following her tragic passing, Libby's classmates offered solace to her grandparents by presenting them with jars filled with sticky note messages, each penned by a child in her class. This gesture served as a means for her peers to cope with the loss while also serving as a poignant reminder of Libby's enduring presence in their hearts. Libby harbored aspirations of becoming a science teacher and held a deep-seated fascination with discovering cures and unraveling mysteries, to the extent that she pursued additional classes at Purdue University to further her interests. Similarly, Abby also nurtured aspirations in the field of forensics and law enforcement. Abby's grandparents, affectionately referred to as Mima and Papa, opted to preserve her belongings exactly as they were on the day she went missing. Diane Erskine, Abby's grandmother, expressed, We just can't erase her from our lives, we just don't want to. We treasure her coat hanging on the coat hook, and her shoes on the shoe rack and her bedroom are just the way she left it. She may have walked out the door, but she is here with us. Abby's family described her as always smiling and having a habitual phrase, often asking, Is there anything I can do to help? Abby and her mother Anna shared a mutual passion for photography. In addition to this shared interest, Abby enjoyed engaging in arts and crafts, and she even spent time knitting hats for newborns alongside her Aunt Maggie. She excelled in volleyball at school and had looked forward to joining Libby in playing softball in the upcoming year. Her grandfather Cliff, brimming with excitement, had journeyed down from Michigan to take Abby on a shopping spree, ensuring she had all the necessary gear for the softball season ahead. Sadly, neither of the two teens' dreams and aspirations would have the opportunity to become a reality due to the actions of their disturbed attacker. And with that, our exploration of the Delphi Snapchat murders has come to a close, at least for now. I'm sure more information and details will continue to emerge as we approach the court trial. And the trial will, hopefully, shed some light on the case and hopefully bring some much-needed justice and closure to the families and friends of the victims. If more information comes out in the meantime, I may do a follow-up to this video with updated details. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you found this video interesting, please like and subscribe and drop a comment down below. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.